Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Joe Cannon, back for episode 47 of my podcast. If you're joining me for the very first time, hey, that's great. You found me. Welcome. I am an exercise physiologist, and each week I'll tackle a different topic related to exercise, health, personal fitness training, rhabdomyolysis, dietary supplements. My areas of expertise really do include both dietary supplements and rhabdomyolysis, where with the case of dietary supplements, I've been investigating them and telling the truth about them, what works, what doesn't work. Since the early 1990s, hard to believe. And in terms of rhabdo, well, um, gee whiz, it's been over 10 years since I've been teaching about that uh, very serious medical disorder, which I'm going to talk about in this episode. But the main thing I want to discuss this week is, well, I have an interview for you. As some of you may know, if you've heard me before, one of the things I do is I teach personal fitness trainers. I, I'm one of the people who's tasked with certifying them, making sure they know what they're doing. One of the things I like doing when I teach these classes is talk about things that never makes it into the textbooks because, you know, textbook stuff is great, but you got to know the real world stuff. I think that's equally as important. And so this week I bring an interview with Martin McLaughlin. Martin is the owner of Extreme Fitness up in the Levittown area, Falls Town, Falls, Fallsington Town of Pennsylvania. Hopefully I didn't butcher that word again. Uh, it's near Levittown, Pennsylvania. He's been in business since, uh, gee whiz, 2001, but I've been a personal trainer since the 1980s. And so between us, between us, I was actually thinking that we've got over 50 years of experience. It's actually more than that, but I'll stop at 50 because so I don't feel old. But we talk about a whole bunch of things this week. Like, for instance, what do personal trainers need to know that they didn't learn in their certification textbooks or after they passed their certification exam, what they should be knowing when they work with their clients, hint, hint, that the stuff also does not make it into the textbooks as well. And so if you are a personal trainer or you want to become a personal trainer, I think you're going to get a lot out of this. Again, you're not going to read this or see this or hear this anywhere else. Oh yeah, and I did say see this because I did record the video of our interview together. That's actually on YouTube right now. So if you went to my YouTube channel, just Joe Cannon MS, you'd find me. I'll link to it in the description if you want to check it out. But no worries. It's essentially the same thing with the audio. As a matter of fact, when you, when you are listening to the audio, you actually get a little bit more, such as all this talk I'm giving you right now, and even the in the introductory stuff that I'll talk about before that, and 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 the little quote of the week that I like to talk about as well. As for the topic I'll discuss beforehand, the myth of the week, as I do like to talk about these things, the myth that I want to discuss this week actually is something I've been seeing a lot on social media lately, especially as the temperature has been warming up. And I've been seeing, unfortunately, people talking about how they've been getting rhabdomyolysis, and some of them are posting pictures of them in the hospital. And one thing that I've noticed, not only recently, but for a long time beforehand, is that when people discuss how they get rhabdomyolysis, uh, which again is a serious disorder where the muscles break down from too much exercise, they sometimes talk about how they weren't hydrated enough. And I always thought that that was a little sad because they're beating themselves up thinking that if they only drank enough water that they wouldn't get this, this condition. And I got to be upfront and tell you that this is an utter myth. I've been trying to bust this myth, drive a stake through its heart for over 10 years. So I'm just going to say it right now. Water does not stop muscle fiber death. And I like saying what rhabdo is because rhabdomyolysis is muscle fiber destruction, muscle fiber death. And when people talk about how they're not hydrated enough, I get where they're coming from. They're thinking about how water can mitigate, reduce the effect of rhabdomyolysis on the kidneys because one of the symptoms or side effects, if you will, of rhabdo is your kidneys may stop working. That's pretty darn serious. The idea they're thinking is if I drink water, that's going to help keep my kidneys flushed and that's going to prevent me from getting rhabdo. Well, that's not true. When people think about rhabdo in terms of the kidneys, they're thinking about it as just being a kidney-centric disorder. 
Rhabdomyolysis is a systemic disorder. It affects multiple organ systems, the kidneys, absolutely, the liver, the heart, all kinds of stuff. You, you, there could be swelling of arms and legs. Drinking water does not stop those other things from happening. I really, really get passionate when I talk about this myth because when people get rhabdomyolysis, they go through what I sometimes call a post-traumatic stress disorder. Rhabdo is a stress and it hits, it comes out of nowhere and it shocks them and it terrifies them. Many people tell me they're afraid to go back to exercise again. And so people deal with a very weighty thing on their mind as they lay there in the hospital bed and even after they go home. And they seem to want to think that if they only did something that rhabdo wouldn't happen. And that something being, if I only drink enough water, water does not stop the process of rhabdomyolysis occurring. In the case of exercise, the thing that causes rhabdomyolysis the most is when we do a lot of activity we're not used to. And drinking water won't stop that process from occurring. And so I really wanted to talk about this this week because I've seen it about three or four times on social media. And again, I just think that people, they're dealing with a lot when they deal with rhabdomyolysis. There is a psychological component to this disorder that very few people talk about besides myself. As a matter of fact, I'll just say it. I don't think anybody out there talks about the psychological component of rhabdomyolysis besides me. And so because it does carry that very weighty cross across people's backs, I, I really think they don't need to add to it. Water you know, it's great. We all need to have water in our systems. We're mostly big bags of water, but you could be hydrated and still get rhabdo. And that's a fact because I've actually interviewed people for this podcast who've told me I was perfectly, perfectly hydrated and I still got rhabdo. That's another proof that this is a big myth. And again, I get why it is. It's people looking at just the kidneys and looking at people on YouTube who are saying things that they really don't understand. There's, yes, there is a lot of people out there in both YouTube land and podcast land who are talking about rhabdomyolysis who don't know what they're talking about. And that's one of the reasons why I talk about it so much because I have devoted over 10 years of my life to investigating this and teaching about it. And this is one of the most pervasive myths out there. And so hopefully if you had rhabdo or you have it right now, or you know somebody who has it, share this with them. Please do, because they're burdening themselves unduly with the thought that they could have done something different. Um, and drinking water is definitely not one of them. In fact, on the, on the flip side of the equation, I'd also point out that you could drink so much water you could create an entirely different phenomenon called hyponatremia. And turns out there is at least one report out there that hyponatremia could cause rhabdomyolysis. So there is even more proof that drinking water doesn't necessarily stop this process, definitely doesn't deal with the other issues, liver problems, heart problems, etc. And so hopefully I've given you a little bit of comfort, uh, taken a little bit off your back that you may be thinking about. Uh, yeah, drinking water is great for keeping your kidneys flushed and that's you know really, really important. But uh, the, the very big thing to remember is that water doesn't stop rhabdo from occurring. It doesn't stop muscle fiber death, as I like to say. So if, if anything, hopefully by me busting this myth right now, I've at least given you a little less to think about is if you're dealing with rhabdo right now. So there you have it. There is the myth of the week. For the rest of my time this week on the podcast, I'm going to interview Martin McLaughlin. Again, Martin is a personal trainer with decades of experience. He owns his own business. And this week we talk about a lot of different things uh, that personal trainers and th those people who want to be personal trainers really do need to know. Again, this is the stuff that never makes it into the textbooks and you can't pay for this. So if you are a personal trainer, you definitely want to listen. So without further ado, let me jump into my interview with Martin McLaughlin. I am here with Martin McLaughlin. He is the owner of Extreme Fitness in Fallingston, Fallingston, PA. Did I say it right? Alzington. Good job. <laughs> Which is near Levittown. Yes, <laughs> yeah. it is. It is. Martin has been in business, well, since the 80s, but he's had his business actually since 2001. 
And what I want to do with this interview is, again, continue with the, my efforts to try to educate the fitness professionals out there on things they don't learn studying for their certifications or what they might not learn working in some neighborhood gym. And so we're just going to go through a bunch of different questions. Hopefully, you'll take something of this and learn from it and grow from it, and this will help you be a better fitness professional. So, Absolutely. Yes. Martin. Let me ask you my, fav my very favorite question that, I, that I, I like to ask people, and that is, what is your biggest frustration with the fitness industry today? Wow. Okay, so um, I, will, I will preface every answer with the, this is my opinion, okay? Um, I've, I've been, like you said, about you know, 20 years as a business owner, I've seen a lot, and I've watched so many different fitness formats come out and franchises and um, things come and go. But um, the one thing that at least helped me shape my own business model that frustrates me the most is the fact that the industry as a whole continues to, um, they, they offer the discounted multiple month agreement for signing up for long term contracts. And, um, you know, I think for, for all of us that are in the business for a long period of time, realize how many things can happen to people in the course of a week, much less a month or a year down the road with injuries and life changes. And just, there's just so much going on. Now we can actually introduce the word pandemic into all of this, as crazy as this is. Um, but my, my beef with it is that, at least in my facility, the way I see it, I have a very diverse community where I am working in group classes, um, personal training as well. I think this goes for both sides of that coin um, with, Folks that are living paycheck to paycheck and want fitness and have chosen my facility and I'm so honored to get to work with them. At the same time, I have people that are in that same room that have been fortunate enough to have graced the pages of Forbes magazine as business owners. So I, I really have an enormous diversity of folks. So for me as a business owner, trying to decide how do I want people to to pay for their fitness, if, if I offer a one year contract at 50% of the cost of a month to month or even a class to class, however that's broken down, to me, I am giving a 50% discount to someone who's so financially stable that they can afford to do that, where the paycheck to paycheck person is gonna pay twice as much for the same service and be in the same room. And I have to, as a business owner, as, as a compassionate human being in the healthcare industry, look at both of these people and be comfortable with that. And um, I, I just can't understand how business owners can do that. And, and I know that is the current business model. It's been that way for a long time. Um, I've listened to people who came to my facility from other facilities who said they were told that my program will not work unless you pay for six or 12 months in advance. So, you know, the, the tactics are really, I'm not comfortable with all of it, let's say. So, you know, to answer that question, you know, as clearly as I can, um, we have always run a pay as you go type of facility, um, one class at a time, one personal training session at a time. I've managed to pull this off for 20 years. So it's nothing that I'm worried about doing. I was certainly worried in the beginning when people who were helping me build my business said, you're out of your mind. You're, gonna, you're never going to make it. You have to have contracts. That's what you have to do. And we do allow people to pay for a month of services at a time, but we've never required it. I thought that if I just, if I worked beyond the limits of my own ability, keep pushing hard, keep doing everything better that I could get people to come back based on quality, on service, on what they're really paying for. And you know, here I am 20 years later, basically doing that. So it's, it's paid off, but um, yes, to, to, to make people feel like they have to pay for the long term when most people cannot, that, just bothers me to my core, bro. 
I agree 100%. Uh, I'm with you. I don't do long-term contracts. I do some personal training with people as well, whether I do personal training, whether I do consulting on the side with people. I don't do contracts either. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I've actually, actually never said on my podcast before, but it, you brought it up when you talked about the long-term contracts. I remember back in the 80s or 90s, maybe maybe you know those two decades were in a, you know almost to the end of each other. I, I had a buddy who literally was hit by a car and uh, he broke multiple bones in his body, in a coma, et cetera, almost died. Wow. But about a month before this happened, he had signed a year or two uh, membership with uh, a gym, which shall remain nameless. They would not let him out of his contract. Wow. They froze it. And uh, again, two years later, he's, you know, he's hobbling around. He decides to go back. He went back for like one, one time and he's like, I'm done. I, can't, I can no longer do what I used to do anymore. And, that, and I've heard similar stories now as, as you know, we're, we're trying to make a plan to reopen post COVID and new policies and how are we, because we basically have had to reinvent our business. Like I'm sure you have, I, I think every fitness based business has had to do this. Um, but we have talked to some folks who very similar story, which is why I'm mentioning it said that um, the, the, the uh, long-term contracts that they were dealing with or the month to month, EFT drafts on their accounts um, were being put on a hold, but were told by the business owners that if they canceled their memberships, that when the business is reopened, they would be charged more to come back. So, you know, <laughs> where does that come from? You know, where is, what happened to the, to the compassion? And I think that's just something that as you refer far back into the eighties, cause I'm 50 years old, you know, I, I remember what it was like. That's when I got started in fitness in 1982. Um, it, it just seemed like it was so much more healthcare oriented, health and fitness oriented then. And uh, mm -hmm. I think it's just a lot of the business has just drifted away from that as of late and, um, mm -hmm. You know, we'll uh, we'll hope that it returns a little bit more to that, especially after this whole experience with uh, health and illness and taking care of yourselves in order to stay healthier. I agree. I agree. You also mentioned something I think the personal trainers who are watching this right now probably didn't cue in on, but I did. You mentioned you're a member of the healthcare system. And I agree 100%. That's actually something I mention in the uh, classes I teach for personal trainers. I usually ask them, what is a definition of a personal trainer? And sometimes it's like you can hear the crickets in the background. There doesn't appear to be, as far as I've ever seen, a real good working definition of what a personal trainer is. So I usually give them my definition, which is a personal trainer is a member of the healthcare system who designs exercise programs in a specific dosage to elicit positive changes in health, fitness, and wellness. And by dosage, dosage is, remember, the personal trainer's watching this, the fit principle, frequency, intensity, time, and type of exercise, the number of days you're working out, the intensity, the type of exercise you're doing. When you're designing an exercise program, you're putting together a recipe, and different recipes are gonna have different outcomes. Are you looking for chili? Are you looking for minestrone soup? Or what are you looking for? So you've gotta put together unique exercise prescriptions for people, and that's why you're in the healthcare business, because, you prescribe the only drug in the world which will simultaneously lower the risk of cancer and heart disease and diabetes and strokes and high blood pressure and kidney cancer, you name it. No drug will do that except exercise. And I know I'm proselytizing here. Uh, so, dude, no, it's just so well put. And, and, and it, it brings back, if I had to say there was a close second to something that frustrates me in the fitness industry, it's group personal training. Yeah. There's really no such thing. That's a group class. It's not, you can't, you can't do what you just said so eloquently, Joe. You cannot put together a recipe, a program, a prescription for fitness based on one person's abilities, their age, their disabilities, the medications they're taking, their physical condition, their mental condition, their pain tolerance, their balance and stability, all of these things, and then add one more person to that same prescription. It doesn't work. So... Um, you're so right. And, um, you know, I think that uh, a lot of the things I see on my Facebook feed are companies that are barking out, stop personal training, stop wasting your time, get more people in at one time. And uh, so it's, it's, it's just, they're not getting what you just said. And uh, that was just so beautiful. Well put. Dude. I appreciate that. Yeah. The group classes is something I've wondered about myself. It's like, at what point do you take the personal out of personal training? 
I mean, if you got 25 people in a, in a, in a personal training session, how as personal is that? And, you know, it, it, again, you'll, as you really said, you have people who are very fit, you'll have people who are very unfit. And for the people, say, working in these big box gyms, you know, one of my little pet peeves is that they don't know if they're teaching a group class, you know, sometimes who these people are walking in, whether it's a spinning class, a body pump class, whatever. And a lot of these gyms don't do any pre-screening. They like to walk in. So, you know, the instructor, they don't know if this person over here had three heart attacks in the past two years or so, or, and, and again, how do you modify exercise program for people who you don't even know what their problem is? And very sadly, they never get to develop the experience yeah. to know how to appropriately modify and regress and prescribe for heart issues, for Parkinson's, for post rehabilitation from injury, from, from anything. They just see everybody as a, a block of ants and they train them all the same way. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a shame that the people in that room never really get it. They don't get the type of instruction that they should get. They're not being corrected the right way. And um, it's, it's just like a conveyor belt of, of fitness. And I know that there's just people that are looking for that. They don't want to be corrected. They just want to go to a gym and say, I'm exercising and to each their own. But we hope as a private facility, like we've been all these years, that that's what separates us, that that's what gets people to walk through our door, not just curiosity and, you know, what are you folks doing here? I want people to come through the door because they know why because they've heard about us and uh, we already have established a bit of trust before we've even met. You know, that's, that's special. That's really good. Uh, now that we just beat up on the whole fitness industry. For <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let's narrow it down. So you, you've been around for, for G whiz like 30 years, essentially, if we take the entire course of your life so far in fitness, um, you, you've seen lots and lots of personal trainers out there over the years as I have. Do you have one big frustration with the personal trainers out there today? You wish they would do something differently or they're not doing what you think they should be doing, et cetera? Yeah, well, I would say, you know, this, this is a two-part answer too, maybe. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the, my biggest disappointment in personal trainers collectively is their lack of anatomy and physiology mm -hmm. education. And um, I see this firsthand when, in, in the past few years, um, I'm trying to bring on a new team member in my facility. And there was many years where I would put it out on Facebook and on Instagram, I'm looking for a new team partner. And you know, my facility is really very different from many others. It's not full of equipment, it's full of open space. We employ the functional training method primarily. So we're, we're pushing, we're pulling, we're running, we're crawling, we're rolling. We really get the human body functioning better. Mm -hmm. And so many people don't come out. I don't think they really know what to do in that environment. They know how to go from machine to machine to machine. Um, but you know, that being said, um, as, as uh, one of my more recent attempts at getting a team member in, I interviewed someone who was a head personal trainer at another facility. And I had a very simple 20 question quiz that really, uh, you know, I, I really felt like anybody could pull this off. Very basic anatomy and physiology. I mean, one of the questions simply was, just name any anatomical structure of the knee. So all they literally had to do was write kneecap, and I would have been happy. It didn't have to be patella or any of that. And the kicker of this whole story is, I interviewed everybody the same way. I set them up in my office where I had two full anatomical charts hanging on the wall, and I left. I said, I'll be back in 10 minutes. They could have used their phones. They could have Googled. Now, maybe they thought there was a camera on them or something, but the bottom line is even that one, name me an anatomical structure of the knee, that head trainer at another facility left it blank. Mm. So, you know, how does that, how does that happen? And I get it, you know, there's, there's no emphasis on it. It's very easy to get certified if you want to get certified quickly. Um, but, uh, it, you know, in my experience to keep people safe, to understand you know, how to train a body part, you need to understand how that body part works. Um, what, what, what are all of the structural components? What, where are the insertions and the origins of muscles? What are their functions? Um, so that's not being emphasized enough. Personal trainers are just not kind of absorbing that or thinking they need to do it. The, the, on the flip side of that is they, they choose to get educated through YouTube. And they're watching nothing but 
just really inappropriate people giving inappropriate advice. I think based on the fact that they've got a great vocabulary in fitness and anatomy, but they don't understand the language as they're using it. So for me, um, I have made very strategic choices in my career to partner myself with um, sports medicine physical therapists, with sports medicine orthopedic surgeons, with sports medicine chiropractors. And we just sometimes, like you and I are right now, we just get hooked up on a FaceTime meeting and we just shoot the breeze. You know, I start asking questions about, you know, why does this happen when this happens and help me understand and to listen to those knowledgeable people just, and they're so excited. They run out of the room and they grab a textbook and they come back in and they're holding it up in front. They just want to teach so much. So. Um, I, I think people need to stay away from YouTube. It's dangerous. It's crazy. And most of the time, if I see something that even I'm kind of questioning, is this right? And I forward that to my mentors, they almost always come back and go, stop. This is all wrong. And let me tell you why. Right. So that's, that's helped educate me. But um, there's just, maybe it's laziness and, and trainers just want to get in the field and get started and they don't think they need to know it. But yeah, I think in a lot of a lot of the big box gyms, there's not a lot of ongoing education. And as I sometimes say, there's nothing healthy about working in most health clubs because you're on the go all the time. It's how can we make as much money as we do? And, you know, there's not a lot of time for learning. As I often say, I think personal trainers spend too much time in the gym, not enough time in a library. Um, they don't have, yeah, I, I got a lot of little, little tourisms like that. Uh, I really do. <laughs> I've had time to think about these things. Um, but, but you're right about the anatomy and physiology. I've seen it myself. Uh, you know, you ask them, they know, you know, you ask them, you know, different body parts. They know biceps, they know chest. Uh, maybe glutes. That's about it. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to know, and, and you know, my staff is very small. I have four people after 20 years, you know, I want somebody to stand in front of me and tell me every muscle in the rotator cuff, yeah, what its function yeah. is because, you know, between the shoulder, the hip and the knee, yeah. these are major components of where everybody gets hurt. Not that we let alone the spine. Right. So, you know, um, I, I'm very blessed that at least in my arena, um, I have, a, a staff that um, continuously wants to learn. Mm. So uh, we work out together almost every day Good. and that helps me communicate to them exactly what's going on. And um, if we can't come up with an answer as to why something is or is not, then we work as a team to try to find what the answer is. But um, I think a lot of trainers are all alone. They walk in that gym all by themselves and they are completely autonomous. They're not being checked they're not you know moving forward in their own education and they're just in their own little bubble and you know you have a few clients under your belt and you think you're doing really well so it's 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 a shame yeah it's it is unfortunate you know you go to work at a gym and the only thing they look at is you know are you are you do you have a are you have a, a, an accredited certification you know like that makes it different um it really doesn't <laughs> uh, again, that's, just, that's a whole other you know ball bank can of fish that i, I could go off on uh, but yeah, they've been bamboozled all the thinking that some certifications are better than others, and which is ridiculous. It's educa it's not it's ed education more than certification. Uh, certification means you know the minimum. And and I don't want the personal trainers right now watching us to think that we're beating up on the industry, beating on personal trainers. We're really not. You know, gee whiz. I mean, you've been doing this a long time. I've been doing this a long time. And as you said, a lot of personal trainers are alone. They don't have the access to someone like you or someone like me on a regular basis who's telling them things that you're not going to hear anywhere else. Because a lot of people, you said on YouTube, you know, they're doing dopey things. They look good, but they don't know a lot. Uh, and you can and, and again, just for the personal trainers watching this, I'll, I'll tell you, I've probably, I, I know I've done over a thousand personal trainer lectures. I've done a, a thousand of them. And the very first one I ever did, and I really don't talk about this very much, but the very first time I ever did a lecture to personal trainers and want to be personal trainers was, again, this was in the, in the late 90s. And there was a guy in my class uh, who I could tell pretty fast didn't really grasp a lot of the anatomy and physiology and the science that you need to know. And like, well, there's not much you could do at this point. So I continued on my, on my merry way, doing my thing, teaching. And at the end of the day, you know, they, they get a test. And he comes up to me at the end of the day and he says to me, I, I don't know how to read or write. And I looked at him. And the, again, this is, this is Joe in the 1990s looking at him saying, get out of here. Oh, sure. I'm thinking, how is this possible in the, in the late 20th century? 
But no, it was true. He didn't know how to read or write. Um, but what I remember about this guy, he was about 26 years old at the time. And I always remember him and I always will remember him because after the class was over, I spent about a half an hour with this guy, just sitting down with him, talking to him, trying to convince him to get into a remedial reading program at like a YMCA or a Jewish community center or something like that. Sure. And I remember him always telling me, but I got the body to do this. And he did. This guy was carved out of granite. I mean, he had like a six pack. He was great. And, and, he, and he kept telling me how he wanted to go and be like a, like going to police academy because he was a young 26. And he said, I want to be like a narc in high school, like 21 Jump Street back then. <laughs> and I'm thinking, but, but, you know, you got to know how to read and write to be a police officer. And, but he kept saying, I got the body. And I'm like, but you don't know how you got it. You know, and I, he's, he's, he has stayed with me all these years. And wow. I know he's really the extreme of what you might run into out there, but they are out there. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, you can go online, you get a personal training certification, take it on your phone sometimes to some of these crazy organizations for like 20 bucks or whatever. And some of those certifications require no continuing education credits ever. Yeah. So there's absolutely no motivation to ever raise your game or learn something new. You just, you have that piece of paper and you think that's, that's it. It's the end all be all. I'm at the top of the food chain. I'm a personal trainer, but uh, I mean, you know, even everybody, hairstylists, doctors, physical therapists, everybody has to go back to school and get some further education. I, I mean, I think you should want to, you know, what can I learn now? How can that house, all of that's only going to help me be better. It's going to give me a wider vocabulary of things to do and to say and to have answers for. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's bizarre, man. It's bizarre. And again, uh, I, I sometimes liken it to a little bit of a laziness. Again, I get frustrated as you do. Um, as you may know, I did a few seminars recently on rhabdomyolysis, Zoom classes, I didn't get half as many people as I really wanted in those classes. Again, I'm, I'm probably the top authority in the whole country on exercise-induced rhabdomyolysis. I'm like, and there are, again, people on YouTube saying crazy things that are not true. I'm the guy who wrote the first book. And again, I didn't get anywhere close to any many people as I was hoping to get in this class to educate them on this very serious medical disorder that's putting people in the hospital from too much exercise. Yeah. So I do link it to a little bit of laziness on their part. Again, it's hard to say. We are living in a world of a pandemic where people are not working like they used to. And I can, you know, look the other way in terms of that. But, uh, you know, I wish they would continue to educate themselves. And again, not just looking at the pretty people on YouTube or, you know, who may not know what they're doing. Pick up a book, crack a book, you know. I, mean, I love my Kindle. I'm always reading on my Kindle. My friend, actually a friend of mine said to me a couple months ago, how do you always find time to read? I got a Kindle. I download books on it. And who am I reading? I'm reading from people who know more than I do about certain times. Yeah, it's funny you say this, you know, one of my, one of my, probably my, my biggest local mentor who's a physical therapist, Doug Armstrong, you're out there. I love you. You know, I do. Um, he, uh, he, you know, said something to me that has always stuck with me. And as you, as again, we were so attached to social networking and we see these super fit people writing stories about, we're going to bulletproof your shoulders and all these amazing things. And he, he said to me at one point, he said, Marty, did that person write a textbook? Because if you knew how hard it was to write and get a textbook published, you wouldn't listen to anybody else anymore. So if it's a textbook, if it's being used in a high level education environment, that is what you need to read. Leave everything else alone, man. Just stick to the textbook. So you're so right. Download legitimate pieces of literature that are textbooks, not just personal trainers that manage to self-publish something, you know? It, it, it needs to be that level of, of information. And I guess maybe, maybe, maybe many people don't read into them because they're difficult to understand if you don't have that level of education behind it. But um, that's where I go, man. I'm a, I'm a textbook guy because I've been pushed that way and it's benefited me greatly. I agree. I'm a big fan of textbooks. And again, not just, you know, again, we're all certified by different organizations. People say to me, you know, what, you know, what book should I read? Go and grab the textbooks of these other organizations and read them. They all have different perspectives on things. And, you know, you can go on Amazon, you can buy, you know, the ACE book and the NSCA book and the ISSA book. You can buy these things online, you know, and some of them are even on Kindle. Again, for me, who loves my Kindle. So, um, again, you can take it anywhere. That's why I do love it. Um, so finish the question. 
I wish personal trainers would stop doing what? Yeah. Um, that's a great one. All right. So I wish, I guess a real fast one would be, um, I, I wish personal trainers would not assume that they are beginning as a great coach. Um, I think that they, they need, you know, they need to be brought down as I was guilty of the very same thing. When I started this job, um, I was in a big box gym and I watched the other trainers in that building as I was just in there working out every day. And I looked at them and I thought to myself, I can do all that. I can, I can do that even better than they can. And, you know, I, I remember having this, um, this, this fascination with walking around with that particular shirt they wore that had trainer written across the back. It was just so amazing to me. And um, when I finally did get certified and I was hired at that facility, I walked in there with my chest out and thought, I'm at the top of the food chain. I'm in a 50,000 square foot facility, man. It can't get any better than this. And I couldn't have been more wrong. And um, in that, in that fishbowl, and that's what I'll call it, even though it was a 50,000 square foot fishbowl, you, you kind of get lost in that. And you might actually think that you are this amazing top line, top level, top of the food chain coach. But the minute you step out of that and um, maybe meet other folks who have, like I did, left and started their own facility and have generated something different, um, focused on special populations or any of those things, you realize very quickly, you know, you start out as the worst coach in history. That's where you are. And two years later, you'll be a sort of good coach. And another year later, you'll be a pretty good coach. And you know, you're never going to be a great coach. There's always going to be greater than you. So I, I wish that they would just realize that there's so much to learn that you're not where you think you are and be humble. Um, understand that the human body is the most amazing complex machine ever created by nature. And uh, even now, I mean, scientists are still trying to figure it all out. How does this work? So we have to be humbled by that and uh, be fascinated by that and want to be educated more about that. So yeah, you know, come into it with, humility and um, you'll, you'll really, then you have a better potential, I think, of becoming a great coach someday. I think that's great advice. I, uh, when you were talking, I was thinking about the people who call themselves master personal trainers and it gives the, the, the impression that there's nothing more to learn. There's always something more to learn. I mean, my gosh, I, I, hopefully I can learn something every single day that I didn't know before. And I do try to do that. So yeah, master personal. I was looking at actually there, were, there was a certification out there. They had master, they had advanced personal trainer. I'm like, what the heck's the difference between them? You know, it's all about the money, Joe. You know, and I, I say that because I'm a certified master personal trainer through ISSA. I basically went through every single certification they had. That's what I wanted to do. When I realized I had all these done, and they sent me an email that said just pay the $75, you've got it all behind you, and we're gonna send you your master certification in the mail. So, uh, you know, to the person going in the gym though, they don't realize that. You know, they think now I'm working with a surgeon instead of a regular doctor of medicine. So it's, 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 it's to the benefit of the trainer knowing that the patron just simply doesn't have that information. Yeah. But uh, it, it's, it's so much more than the title, man. It's, 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 the title is meaningless without the education behind it. I agree. I agree. The education should never stop. And that makes it very difficult for that person working in, again, that, that big box gym where they're coming in at five o'clock in the morning. Sometimes they're, they're, they're there till 10 o'clock at night. In some instances, they're popular. And you know, when do you have time to read? When do you have time to learn? You know, that's why I usually turn them on to like, you know, iTunes University. If they have an iPhone, they can download the iTunes University app and listen to college courses on exercise science, nutrition, sports nutrition for free. So wow. the iTunes, you people, iPhone, you people you know, listen to us right now, just download that app and it, it's 100% free. You can listen to all this stuff. How cool is that? It's, we live in an amazing age. Um, we do, exactly. We really do. Uh, you probably already addressed this um, since we've been talking off the cuff on a lot of different topics, but you have personal trainers. You've hired a lot of personal trainers. You've seen them over the years. What are some traits that you look for in, in a personal trainer if you're thinking about hiring them beyond maybe the, the anatomy knowledge? Is there something else that you, you think would, that would bode well for someone who's going to work well with you or be a successful personal trainer? What, do you, what traits do you think they might have that'll help them stand out from the pack? Because there are a lot of them out there. 
Yes, um, it, it's really gonna, it, for me, um, I, I, I am the master energy producer in my gym. Um, I, no matter who I've ever had working underneath of me as a staff member, um, I want them to be as close to the energy and the passion um, and, uh, uh, and the compassion, let's say that as well, that I produce on a minute by minute basis throughout the day. That is so, so, so important to me that everybody is in that energy level that is addictive, it is contagious. It's, that's what's bringing people, one of the main factors that brings people back to my facility since they have absolutely no obligation to ever come back. Every single time they walk out that door, I run the risk of never seeing them again. So to be, um, to, to not have charisma, to not have a working vocabulary, to not have humor, um, to not have immediate understanding um, and empathy and all of those things. Uh, it, it's such a well-rounded human that I'm looking for. And for me, you know, I could see the, the most educated person coming right out of college with an exercise science degree. Maybe they're even a physical therapist. So they have all of the tools I'm looking for in the working knowledge of the brain, but they simply don't have the energy. They don't have the working experience to be able to package all of that up and deliver it in front of somebody that makes them not be able to wait to tear that package open. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think um, finding folks that really within 60 seconds of meeting them, I feel that energy, I feel that passion, I can see it in their eyes. And I know I'm dealing with somebody who loves what they're doing. That is, that's number two, right after the education portion for me, man. And that's, that was almost impossible to find. It really is hard, man. And uh, I, I, I uh, compromised many times, um, look, taking the education portion over that energy portion. And without that energy portion in a facility like mine, they just, they got drowned it out. They couldn't really maintain that level of output and they were very quickly separated like different from the rest of us that were just going like we do being the kind of trainers um, that we are and they didn't last long so um, uh, the, the, the now is kind of my right hand man has been with me now for uh this is his eighth year it's in i'm blessed to have somebody for that long and um, I'll, I'll never find another James never in my life I know that and um, we take great care of him and we're looking for another guy and we just picked another one up believe it or not we hired somebody during the pandemic uh, because um, with our online classes the way they were we actually needed some assistance so here I am again looking at another young guy who was loaded with passion and couldn't wait to get started and he's moldable he's bendable he is appreciative and he wants to learn so um uh you know getting a chance to actually mentor somebody up to understand how i want things to be done in my facility is a wonderful thing that's really nice that's really good um so let's talk to that person maybe watching us right now just stumbled upon this video and their or podcast if you're listening to audio of us and they are thinking about becoming a personal trainer What's something that somebody who wants to be a personal trainer may not realize about what it's like to be a personal trainer? Is there something out there that maybe they may not get studying in a textbook or, you know, they're thinking about, oh, you know, you know, what, you know, they think it's all going to be, you know, roses. And I remember hearing something over the loudspeaker of a gym one time and, you know, join the, you know, join our, our, our wonderful and growing staff. And they made it seem in this, 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 uh, this recording, like it was this, you know, this great thing they were, they were doing. And I'm like, <laughs> you only knew. <laughs> yes. I think they need to know. Um, it's really hard work man it is super hard and i'll say part of that is because i don't think trainers are ever really truly educated in the fact that although they wear the trainer shield on their shirt on the back side of that shirt is therapist and you're gonna hear it all and what do you do with that you know do you not become a part of that you know you, you run this line of personal training 
And all of this trust we're trying to build with people. And I want you to know that no matter what, I would never make you do anything that I know you cannot do. And we're really dancing on a fine line between staying in a business relationship and becoming a friend to these people that we work with. And to, to pick one side of that line could hurt you in the long run. I think, um, you know, you need to find a way to really get as close to that line as possible and understand that in our environment, at least this is my, again, my opinion, um, the folks that come to me, they know, I don't know anybody that they know. And so, and, and on top of that, when people wind up in discomfort, when they're in pain, they say things, <laughs> you know, the vault starts opening. Sometimes the tears start coming and you wind up thinking, I make a joke to everybody who eventually will say, I'm so sorry. I just said all of that to you. I know that's not really your job. I always say, listen, if I had started writing books with anonymous names in my first year, I'd be one of the biggest best selling authors in the world. I wouldn't have to do this anymore. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'm living a soap opera every day. So, um, you know, they're just, I don't know that they're prepared for the level of closeness that a really good coach is going to get with specific people. I mean, if you're going to be a group class instructor, maybe you don't ever really need to cross that bridge. But if you're going to be a personal trainer and, and intend to be at this, I'm training some people that I met in that big box gym 20 years ago. I'm still training them today. So how do you spend three days a week, for a half an hour every day for 20 years and not become emotionally attached in some ways. So uh, I think that, you know, there, there almost ought to be a chapter in every personal training certification that at least touches on that topic. And we all know where we need to draw the line and say, you know, if I'm going to operate within my scope of practice, which most trainers will not do, um, I'm going to refer you out on this thing. I think you should go and do this. You need to go and give this guy, this girl a call. Go talk to your primary care physician. There's a spot where we all have to say, I have to put my hands up and just give me this social distance. Um, no pun intended, but um, I don't think they realize how much that becomes a part of the job. It's a good, it's a really good point. Networking with other professionals, whether they be physical therapists, athletic trainers, dietitian, nutritionists, uh, you know, even the primary care physician sending out, you know, maybe periodic reports to the doctor saying, Hey, this is what your, your, your patient's been doing with me for the past six months. Um, I think that's really good because, you know, you don't want to step over your boundaries and start, you know, saying, Oh, you should take this dietary supplement and that dietary supplement. Oh, it's a, it's, that's, yeah, that's, that's a mess. That's a nice mess. Or your shoulder hornet. So I saw this guy on YouTube and he said, do this the minute that something's wrong. And, and, um, you know, from, from very, one of my very first clients I ever had in my career at that big box gym, I'll reference it again, was uh, a guy who was, um, recovering from a stroke. He couldn't walk. He couldn't move the one side of his body. And, and his whole thing was, I want to get out of this wheelchair and just be able to walk with somebody helping me over to the juice bar so I can get my drink. So, you know, this was part of how we did that. It took a lot of research. I had to physically pick up the phone one day and call a physical therapist and ask if I could get some advice. And that started me down that path of realizing where that's where I want to network myself and you know, those physical therapists, those doctors, those chiropractors, those surgeons, believe it or not, they love it when you as a personal trainer are letting them know how that person is doing post-surgery, post-physical therapy, post-even chiropractic adjustment that day. Mm -hmm. And uh, you wind up with this massive communication skill between people in the healthcare industry where we should be focusing all of our efforts. And it's, it's been a blessing, man. I, I think everybody needs to know where their scope of practice is and, and hand it off, hand off the football. Yeah, I think that's really neat. Again, I think for the personal trainers, remember, you know, you may see your clients, you know, one, two, three days a week, 30 to 60 minutes a day. Sometimes, again, in your case for years, my case for years too. Uh, but again, for a doctor, they may see their patient when they're sick, maybe once or twice a year for about three to five minutes a visit. Yeah, in the fitness business, you're going to see that person a lot more. So you're going to be able to know a lot more stuff about them, be able to report more to their you know, their physician, physical therapist, et cetera, how they're doing. Uh, but you, you touched on something else that, I, I, again, I wanted to circle back and talk about, and that is people during personal training sessions are going to tell you stuff, you know, things that maybe they wouldn't tell to, you know, maybe their wife, their husband, maybe their friends or coworkers. So you're going to hear things 
And I, I think the personal trainers who are just entering the, enter, entering the industry now should need to realize whatever you are told during these sessions, you got to zip it. You can't be going out and saying, oh, Bob Smith told me yada, yada, yada. Uh-uh. You are like a priest. You are like a psychiatrist. You know, you're like a bartender. <laughs> you don't yes. talk. You don't what talk. happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, brother. You <laughs> yeah. don't. Then we've got the HIPAA laws that we really have to conform to also. We're not doctors. Right. But, you know, these, these are things that will tank your business. Let's just say that. You know, if you start being that guy or that girl that's going to go out and start repeating what people said, you're dead in the water, um, but um, you know from a from a liability standpoint, you've got there's legal issues, there's lots of things. So yeah, you need to learn to be a vault and suck this up, and then what do you do with it? You know, and um, I've, uh, I've I've had trouble with that over my career. Um, it, it, it's it's almost like it's a a vampiric draining of energy. You know that that you you can't really recover from when you go to bed that night. You wake up the next day and, you know, your affect is still not correct. And you might be just bothered so much by a Trump. Some, you, like I said, you hear it all. So, you know, I've, I've learned to meditate. I have learned to break things down. I've learned to put myself in quiet spaces and collect myself. Uh, when I come home from the end of a day and my crazy gym with the music blasting and all of this a lot of times negative energy bouncing off of my body like a trampoline. I just, and that's where I am. I'm, I'm down in my, my little drum lab in my basement. And um, I, I need to do something every day that takes me away from every other thought. And uh, drumming for me has been a, an amazing treat and something that has helped me, but we all need hobbies. We got to get out of, out of that loop because it can be hurtful to us. It can be. We all have to take a little bit of a page out of Queen Elsa's book and just let it go sometimes. And uh, that's, that's, her. That's, that's not something I think they're going to they're gonna hear in uh, your run-of-the-mill personal training uh, textbook or even when they're talking to other personal trainers. You know, I, I have never actually been in a gab session with personal trainers and say, you know what, so-and-so just drains my karma. I got no energy. And I've been in that situation where you're like, oh, oh. You know, and, and, and again, they'll tell you things. And for me, I want to help all the time. And sometimes you can't help. No. You know, it's just, you just, you just can't. No, you just, maybe you realize that just because you listened, you helped. You're absolutely and, right. You know, and that's what, you know, a lot of people go to therapists hoping they're going to get an answer and they never really do. They just got a chance to blare it out. They got that demon out of their body mm -hmm. uh, to somebody who didn't judge them, who didn't tell them what to do, who didn't make them feel worse about it. And, you know, if that's all we can do, as long as it's not really having a lasting effect on us as professionals, fitness professionals, then, you know, I'm willing to, I'm willing to walk that line. I have been all this time and um, I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it's made me a better person. It, it reminds me that the things that bother me in the course of a day, a lot of times really aren't so bad. I'm really <laughs> complaining about nothing and I should just stop, you know? Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Definitely. Um, so when I talk to personal trainers, one of the things I like to, I've, again, I got all these little truisms and one of the truisms I usually say is, you know, you, you can't train a not so healthy person the way you train a healthy person. You know, they have arthritis, had a heart attack, had a knee replacement. You got to design programs around whatever the limitations or health conditions might be. Um, it, it, having said that, is there, is there anything that you wish personal trainers would know about the people who hire them? Um, yeah, my big thing is, again, most people who hire trainers, they're, they're not healthy. I mean, especially as, they, as we get older, you got people with high blood pressure and, you know, you got to know how to work with these individuals. So that's just something that I like to throw out to them so they know you can't train a 20-year-old like you can a 70-year-old. Right. I, I think maybe, um, maybe my answer would be that, um, you know, as you're saying, and we do, we meet people from all across the spectrum, from 10 years old to 90 years old. Uh, we meet people who have never exercised a day in their life, and we meet people who have been maybe even semi-professional athletes, uh, maybe even professional athletes for that matter. I mean, we're all doing this, uh, but the fact of the matter is that and no matter how much exercise they've done, no matter what they said they have done, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know. And you can't ever just think that they do. So, uh, you know, I watch um, a, lot of, a lot of trainers working with people and they're counting reps. 
and they're giving um, a, an occasional verbal cue, but they're, they're not correcting. They're not observing. They're not criticizing the fact that the knee went beyond the toe. They're not criticizing the fact that the heel lifted just a quarter of an inch, you know, and that, that should be what we're doing is just realize, man, no matter how good they are, they still, we all still need direction. We can't, we can't see what we're doing. A lot of times we can't feel what we're doing as, a, as an exerciser and that people need constant guidance constant we all say great job that's a great like you're doing so good great job that's what we have to do but people will look right at me and go you say that to everybody bro yeah and i'm like you're you're right you're right and and but do you want me to help you want me to tell you what you did wrong here's where we go so you know getting somebody to realize wow i got to take this 225 pounds off this barbell and go all the way back to a piece of hollow pvc to relearn this motion as a 45 year old weightlifter who's coming in for some advice, I mean, you might, you might really make some people angry, but I think what you're gonna wind up doing is creating more respect between the people you're trying to harness as a long-term client and just know they don't know. They don't know what you know. Um, they only know what they know and what they've been told before. So when I meet people sometimes, um, when I'm doing a fitness assessment, I say, have you ever had a personal trainer before? And sometimes they say, no. I'm like, great, that's the best answer I ever had because now I know I'm not gonna have to make you unlearn something that you may have spent years learning that may not have been quite right and, and I got a blank canvas. I'd rather have that sometimes. It's right. much easier to paint on that blank canvas than to do a cover up of somebody else's errors perhaps. But um, yeah, they, they, they need to know no matter how experienced of a person they're working with that they still don't know. You're still the fitness professional. You're still in charge of every movement, of every rotation, of every pivot, of every movement that's going on. And you need to be attentive to all that all the time. Don't get distracted. You, you actually just, just answered my very next question, I think. I, we've actually been answering my next question the whole time. What are some traits that uh, you think would stop personal trainers from succeeding? And you just already kind of gave that. You have the energy, you got to be professional, you got you to be humble, you got to have empathy with people. Um, can you, could you add anything to that? If that trainer who's like, I'm, you know what, I'm certified and you know, I got this cert and that cert and I'm spinning my wheels. Yeah, you know, and, and, and part of that, and I realize it even at my level, whatever that is in this industry, that, you know, we are, we're lit, we are working in an industry that is no different from the computer industry. Right. And every six months, there's going to be a new fitness franchise trying to take people out of your gym. Mm -hmm. They're going to offer a better deal. It's going to be another fabulous thing that is designed to burn calories and be, you know, we are fighting a losing battle as personal trainers. We're like dinosaurs, man. There's fewer and fewer of us every year doing what we do. And there's more and more and more boutique fitness centers doing what they do. People want to have fun. They want to socialize. They want to have an application that shows them how many calories they burn. They want to compete against Joe and Jeff and Bill on that flat screen. And to, to pull away from that and bring it down to a you and me, that's really a challenge to pull off right now. Um, and it's not going to get any easier. When you look at it, comparatively speaking, we are significantly more expensive in the course of a month than the person who could go to a boutique fitness center mm -hmm. unlimited for a month for a hundred bucks or 150 bucks a month. Um, you might be spending that every single week as a personal training client, depending on what you're doing and who you're doing it with. So um, I think uh, the, 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 they, they're, they're going to, they, they're forced to struggle because the industry is leaving us behind. And we as personal trainers need to work really harder at leveling up what we do to remain valuable, to remain needed, and uh, to remain a valuable resource to the fitness industry. It's a really good point, it definitely is. Um, if we go back in time to when you started your business all the way back in 2001, if you had to do it over again, what would you do differently, if anything? Hmm, let's see. Um, 
That's a tough question, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, and I want to, I want to put, I want to put a good answer out here. Um, <laughs> You've already uh, been giving good answers for the whole hour, or so we've been. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, um, if I had it to do over again, I, I would still have become a personal trainer, and I'm prefacing my answer with that because I love what I do, um, but I would have become a licensed physical therapist first. I would have wanted that much of uh, my idols in this bit, in, in, in the healthcare industry are those knowledgeable physical therapists that just have this instant understanding of how to correct, how to fix, how the body works. And I'm fascinated by that. And I'm, I'm, I'm playing catch up. I'll be playing catch up to them for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, to have had that level of base knowledge and then applied the energy and the drive and, and you know, uh, no offense to people who are coming out of surgery. That's not what I would have wanted to do in my career. It's too slow for me. Mm -hmm. It's a little too delicate for me. I want to go. I want to go. I want to push. But to have had that level of education um, and be able to apply it to the type of, of work I do right now, man, would I have made a different choice. I would have gone straight into that physical therapy degree and, and done that. And I would suggest that to anybody watching this video who's even thinking I might want to be a personal trainer at some point. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain by having that level of knowledge behind you. And who knows, maybe you would decide to change your mind and become a physical therapist and help people. That's, that's what our job should be. It's still about helping. It's about losing weight and it's about making people stronger and making them healthier and all of that. But I love it when they come in and tell me they got off of their heart medication. I love it when they tell me their blood sugar is back normal again, when their blood pressure is back to normal. They, you know, that's, that's my best reward ever. So, um, you know, get, get that. I would have gotten a higher level of knowledge. That's where I would have went. Well, knowledge is always there for us, but yeah, I hear you. I went to school with a guy who's a physical therapist and I joke, he knows everything I know and a whole lot of crap I don't know because he went on, he got his master's in ex-phys and he went on and got his master's in physical therapy. So yeah, he's uh -huh. definitely the total package. Yeah, I'm jealous um, of his brain, dude. You know, yeah, it's just oh, good yeah. stuff, man. I call him a lot, but you're, no, you're absolutely right about the, uh, about when they, they have their, their achievements. I, I have a, a client that I've seen and um, he's in a wheelchair, been in a wheelchair for many, many years. He, uh, again, he, he, through his own sheer, nothing, you know, nothing that I, I think that I can take credit for, but you know, he, he got himself off of all of his diabetes medications, his metformin. He's no longer, he did it from a wheelchair. Wow. And that is on top of us working out five days a week for an hour a day. Uh, yeah, he's a quadriplegic, but uh, he, oh. he is, he's my hero. I mean, I uh, took the words right out of my mouth. I was just going to say he's a hero, Joe. This guy is, he, he's, he's a poster board for yeah. what can be done if you try. He is from a wheelchair. It, it is, it is amazing. So, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing what the human body can do when the will is there for sure. Um, oh, and the right kind of guidance, Joe, you, you got to give yourself some credit there, brother. You know, that's just something clicked between you two and look what you did, you know, so good for you, man. I'll, I'll take some small uh, accomplishment of that, but it was basically all him. I, I, I got to give it to him. He's, he's, he's an incredible guy. I uh, love him a lot too. Um, what, what is, since you've been in business so long, uh, you, you've seen a whole lot of stuff. People have told you a whole lot of things. What is the very best piece of advice, generally speaking, business, non-business, that anybody's ever given you about the whole fitness world? This is an easy answer for me. I'm so okay. blessed, man. I'm so lucky. So I have to preface this with a little bit of a story. Um, in 2006, um, I went to the, uh, the Arnold Classic out in Ohio. I went there several years. Folks, if you're watching this and you have never been there, of course, I know many people didn't get to go this year because of the pandemic, but put it on your calendars to go. It is inspiring. It is an amazing festival of everything that we hold so close to us. But uh, when I went in 2006, uh, Jack LaLanne was there that year. Nice. And he was going to be the keynote speaker in an active aging um, seminar that he was giving with his wife. So uh, I woke up early that morning and I, I ran over to the Hyatt and um, we, we went right to where that I didn't care about anything else that day. I just wanted to listen to Jack talk. And we were first in line. I was there an hour early. I thought there'd be a lot of people there. There was no one there. There was a couple of security guards standing outside the door. We got to convince him with them. And um, at one point, one of the security guards looked at me and he said, do you want to see him? I said, 
yeah, is he in there? And they said, yeah, 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 look. So they pushed open this big door and you know, here's my inexperience. I'm looking through this whole ballroom and I'm just like, it was like fine Waldo. I see no one. I said, I don't know where he is. And all of a sudden this arm came over my shoulder and pointed down and said, there. I'm thinking, you know, Jack is this six foot massive guy. He's this icon. No, he's five foot tall. He's, I had to bring my level down. There he was in his blue jumpsuit, like just like you expect him to be with his wife. And uh, he said, go ahead in, go ahead in. So we, I'm there with one of my trainers at the time. We walked in, there was a round table in the back of the room. Jack was so wonderful, introduced himself. We introduced ourselves. He said, have a seat. So here I am sitting in a round table with Jack and his wife, myself and another, there's no one else in this room to, to heaven above. This is a true story. And um, we just, we just, we, we started just talking about you know, I told him I was a trainer. Where are you from? What do you do? And, you know, he was so kind. His eyes were the bluest, youngest eyes I've ever seen. It was, it was, I'm getting goosebumps on my arms, bro. It was such a crazy thing. But what he said to me was at the end of that short talk, it, it was 10 minutes, that max. But he said to me, don't ever do, don't ever try to do what anybody else is doing already better start doing something that nobody else is doing and do that better than anybody else who tries to copy you and it was just it was like an epiphany in my head all i'd ever done before is just looked at the industry and tried to copy it that's what we do how can i bring people from that facility into my own facility i need to do more of what they're doing in order to capture that group well you know and i realized after you know thinking about all of that after meeting him that that was never working i, I was still kind of getting people because of who i was because of what i was presenting but you know this thing of trainers thinking you're going to get people from another facility it's not going to happen. They're, they're communities. They love their facilities. They're there because they want that. And so it, it really, that was the day that I kind of abandoned almost the whole training routine I had, which was very basic as a young trainer would be. We were doing biceps and triceps and pull downs and bench presses and lunges and squats. And um, I decided to get more involved into what functional training was. No one was doing that back in 2000 when I was looking at doing this. Um, I jumped on a plane. I flew down to uh, the Institute of Human Performance in Boca Raton. I met Juan Carlos Santana and spent three days in his facility getting certified as a functional training specialist. It was another great hands-on, get educated from somebody who's really knowledgeable about all this. And, um, you know, those two things completely altered my path. But that advice that Jack gave me that day, and I would regurgitate that to anybody any day, man. Stop mm. thinking you need to copy what other people are doing and doing that better. Build your own brand. Make it something that nobody else can touch. And if you feel like people are approaching you, you got to push harder. You got to find a way to stay ahead of that particular thing. Find your niche and build that. And, um, you know, rest in peace, Jack. You, you changed my life that day. I have a picture of the two of us arm in arm in that room in my gym. It's an amazing thing for me. And, that was, it was amazing, man. What a gift. Very cool. That's a great, great story. Um, and for the younger trainers who are watching us right now and they're saying to themselves, unfortunately, who? Jack Lane, look him up. Jack Lane is the, was the biggest name in fitness. Godfather of fitness, my yeah. friend. You know. you know, Jack invented the lat pull down machine and the stick <laughs> pin in the weight stack machine. First gym in the world, of, in, the, in America, that was co ed that sold vitamins. Longest running television show in US history on exercise, 34 years. If you don't know who Jack is, you need to go and just research him and his wife, Elaine Lalane. <laughs> Elaine Lalane, right? What a name, man. Yep. You know, look and look at the feats of, 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 of the feats he performed. Yes. Swimming from Alcatraz Island to Angel Island with boats attached to him, with people in them. I mean, the guy was- Handcuffed. Handcuffed. <laughs> he was not from this world. He was, he was a beacon of, of power and happiness and health. And, uh, you know, my wife, she, she's older than me. My wife is, uh, she'll be 64 this year. And so she oh. remembers the show a little bit more than I do. But it's, the funny part is she always says to me, Marty, every time that show came on, he would start off saying, Hello, ladies. 
because yes, it was that far ago that most of the time there was a lot of women at home while the husbands are working and right. he got them into fitness. And then he just, he just found a way to keep finding himself current right. in fitness, in what he wrote, in the speeches he gave, in his juicer and everything else that came out of Jack, you know, he was, the, it, the mold was broken. We'll never have another one. Never. Uh, what, what, what an amazing man. But yeah, I don't think anybody who's in fitness should not know who that person is, man. I what know. a wonderful guy. I know. And, and you just search for Jack LaLanne on YouTube and his TV show will pop up. And he's just not the guy you saw in the 90s with the juicer. He's so much bigger than that. Uh, Jack is literally bigger than Arnold, bigger than all of them. Uh, yeah, there'll never be another one like Jack. He's, uh, yeah, set the world push-up record in the 1950s when he was 50, I think, something like that. From that Lillane plank that he could do. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do it either, bro. I try all the time. I can't do it. Forget it, man. Yeah. I mean, I know he was only five foot tall, but you still got to be able to do it. It's, right. And he was, a, he was a beautifully built man. He, was. he wasn't crazy big. He just, you know, he, yeah. he built a machine on food. Yes. And um, on sensible training, he was, he was, yeah. he was wonderful, man. Yeah. That's going to bring our, that's gonna be a great way to end our, our time together this week. You, you can't end it on any more of a higher note than Jack Lane. Um, so <laughs> I, I couldn't do it if I even tried. So. <laughs> but you, you definitely made, uh, made the ending of this, this episode really, really good. Um, what is the very best way people can get a hold of you, Martin? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, been in this business so long, I'm everywhere, man. Um, you know, my personal page, um, I got probably about 50 people left before I get the 5,000 red flag on that thing. I don't know why Facebook does that. Um, our Facebook business page is Extreme Fitness Personal Training. And um, generally on all of my profiles, I'm, I'm kind of hard to, to miss. So you'll know you're at the right point. Um, our Instagram handle is Extreme Fitness Training. And um, certainly through our website, Extreme Fitness P as in Peter, A as in Apple.com. Uh, you can always email me through that structure there. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not too hard to find, but uh, I, I, I'd love to host any questions anybody has who's watching this as it gets posted and moving forward, man. Good luck to everybody. Push yourselves. Don't limit yourselves. Keep trying to be a better version of yourself. And remember, man, you are here to help people. That's our job. I couldn't have said it better myself. Martin McLaughlin, Extreme Fitness in Pennsylvania. Thank you very much for your time. Greatly appreciate it. That was an honor, Joe. Thanks for having me. I really enjoy doing interviews like this because there's so much out there in the fitness world that never makes it into certifications or textbooks. And so many personal trainers have to learn this information the hard way on their own. As we talked about in the interview, so many fitness trainers are alone. They don't have anybody to talk to about these things. They don't have a mentor. And so my hope in doing these interviews is that, you know, we can kind of be your mentor and shed lights on things that maybe you hadn't thought of and take your thinking in a new direction. The end result of this is that you become a better, more well-rounded fitness professional. So if that's what happened in this episode, then, you know, we achieved our goal and that's a good thing. In the beginning of this episode, I told you one of my areas of expertise is dietary supplements. And if you are curious about more of that, I'm actually doing a class, an online course on anti-aging and immune supplements, which I'll put a link to in the description. That's going to be June 14th, which is a Sunday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Yeah, I have a lot to say about what supplements work, what don't work, the side effects of these things, and hopefully show you some things that are pretty inexpensive that uh, could save you some money depending on what you're looking to do. So that's a immune system and anti-aging supplement. Again, that's going to be a class, an online course I'll be doing on June 14th. So again, I'll link to that in the description so you could check that out and sign up if you want to do so. If you want to get a hold of me, want to know more information, you can easily reach me at my website, joe-cannon.com. That's my personal website where I do lots and lots of writing about personal fitness training, certifications, health, wellness, product reviews, and stuff like that. And then my other website is just devoted nothing to diet, nothing but dietary supplements, and that is supplementclarity.com. Again, I'll link to them in the description so you could check them out for yourself. 
And with that, I'm going to bring our time to a close for this week anyway, except for one last piece of business, and that is the quote of the week. This one comes to us from the greatest boxer who ever was, Rocky Balboa, who said, it's not about how hard you get hit, it's about how hard you get hit and keep moving forward. Until next time, same bad time, same bad channel, I'm Joe Cannon, go out, be safe, and where you can, try to make a difference.